What's up, YouTube? I'm going to be doing another breakdown video. Today is going to be Inferno. You guys seem to like the last Mirage video, so I think I'm going to be doing more of these uh, map breakdown videos just at like a, a higher level for like teams or players who want to get to um, a higher level would face it. And um, yeah, general stuff like that. So to start out, I'm just going to talk about Inferno at like a base level. It's not going to be played the same way as um, some other maps. The reason why I like doing uh, breakdowns on Mirage and Inferno is because the concepts that apply to Mirage and Inferno can actually be applied to many other maps. Mirage is more of a, you play the avoidance game on T side, you try to figure out where the CTs are and not go to where they are. Whereas Inferno is more of a push and pull and you are the one on T side who kind of dictates where the CTs are going. And it's up to the CTs to understand when the T's are trying to do that at a high level pretty much what it is the whole game of inferno is just push and pull um, and what i mean by that is because the areas of control on inferno are so close to the bomb sites as opposed to mirage again apps is close to the bomb site but app sucks to go through but for the most part teams will be defaulting mid or doing executes things like that but basically the thing about inferno is you don't have as much of a heads up on ct side as you would on mirage on mirage you see a smokes coming over you have time to drop smokes uh molotovs it's harder to do site pops basically on mirage at least for a but pretty much both sites on inferno can be treated like exaggerated versions of their mirage counterparts so for instance be on inferno you are extremely close to the bomb site where you would normally execute from which is in the car position so it's up to the CTs to try and deny this control or make it very, very hard or taxing on the T's to take in the form of util, bodies, um, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you look at A, A is kind of a harder place to execute. A I would consider or I would compare to A on Mirage just in the sense that if you're a CT, you generally have a heads up on what's going on um, when the execute is coming in and uh, what they're going to throw for the execute. So. At a base level, the CT's job on Inferno is to try and slow down the T's default, uh, similar to the con player's role on Mirage that I talked about in the last video. Essentially, what the CT's are going to be doing is slowing down the T's, making it very, very taxing for them to take control, and using the information on how they're taking the control to dictate what you think the T's are going to be doing. So... It's normal to see CTs go for banana control, and generally what that would look like is like a bottom banana smoke. Pro teams are throwing the bottom mid smoke from CT, and that bottom mid smoke blocks off banana and bottom mid. Um, let's see if I remember the lineup. So you come up into this little corner with the chair, um, you aim to the top right of this dot, and you just normal jump through. And basically how this will pop is it will block off banana, it will block off mid, and it will slow down the T's um, very, very hard the control that they're taking and basically what this does is it means that if the t's are going to take banana within the first 20 seconds they have to force through a bottom banana smoke which percentage wise and again when you're playing at a high level you're trying to play all the maps to a highest percentage that's going to suck for the t's it's going to be hard to control it's going to be hard to take they have to play through a smoke which means they could be running into a molly they could be running into nades and one of the concepts you want to know as a b player on inferno on ct side is that there are only so many places that the t's can be and this is part of the reason why the Astralis meta back in 2018, 2019, 2020 was so strong is because Inferno was one of their best maps. And basically what they did is the way teams were playing Banana before this is they would smoke deep, they'd throw some nades to do damage, but not necessarily take control. What Astralis end up, ended up doing is they would do deep smoke, they would do a close molly, they would do a molly for either logs or broom, and they would nade the other side. And basically what this does is the only place that the T's can be in banana is either close half wall. They can either be logs or broom or they're behind a the smoke, right? So what they do with this util is they block off that, they block off that, and let's say they double nade logs, right? Now the T's cannot be in banana whatsoever without even peeking, you know this information, right? So what they would do is they'd throw this utility, they'd rotate one off, and then once this guy took banana, he would get dropped a smoke or something and he'd jump spot. And if he sees any of the T's, he'd either smoke half wall, he'd either, um, you know, smoke them off, he'd get this control. And this allows for a rotate from the CT's. And one of the things about Inferno is that the CT rotations are extremely long. So the reason why it's somewhat tough to play CT side on Inferno is because if you gamble the wrong bomb site, you're essentially going to be losing the round. I just aim locked again. Uh, dude, it happened in the first video. But yeah, the CT rotates are so long and the ways you pop into sites as T's is so short comparatively if you compare the distance that as CT's you have to make really, really, really good reads on where you think the T's are going. 
How are you going to do that is by taking banana control, by, um, you know, having bracket control, trying to get your offer to get picks. Because something, an, another concept that I want to kind of harp on here is it's okay to stack the wrong bomb site if you have a man advantage. Man advantages are extremely important on Inferno. Generally, the best teams on Inferno have the highest conversion rate for 5v4 situations. So what that means is basically if they get an opening pick, they have the highest rate of converting that round into a round win. And the reason why is because let's say your opera gets an opening pick in bottom mid, or let's say he goes for a pick down alt, right? Now you're playing a 5v4. You don't need a ton of numbers or a ton of utility to retake in a 5v4 situation. You can run down the clock. You can use a ton of utility. Again, there's only four players. You have five players. You should be winning the situation majority of the time. So what teams will do is they'll go for a lot of opening picks. You'll see offers go for a lot of opening picks on Inferno, and they'll fall back and stack a bomb site. And the reason why you stack a bomb site in this scenario is because if you have your opper go to the site that's not stacked, let's say he gets a pick on the execute and he dies, or let's say um, he's able to spam one through a smoke or look over a smoke or do normal gimmicky things that oppers do to get picks. If he gets another opening on the, on the site execute, which generally if you're CT side, you're holding an angle, think of percentages. If they are coming at you, you're standing still with a one shot gun posted on them. Chances are you're going to get the kill more than them. So you should come out on, on top of that situation majority of the time. And retaking a site 5v3 should be a guaranteed win. So this is what teams will do on Inferno if they get the opening pick, is they'll shift the numbers in a way that makes sense with the opera and with the numbers and with the information that the T's have given them. So this is all baseline Inferno theory. Now we'll get into like the more push and pull T side of it, okay? So again... Like I said earlier, the rotates for the CTs are very, very hard. And the goal of the T's is to try and pull the rotations from the CTs so that they can go to the bomb site with the least amount of players. Now, how teams will do that and how teams did that on the old Inferno is they would do, um, at least pro level teams, is they would do, let's say, a porch molly. They would do, sometimes they'd do a molly for arch. They'd flash, you know, a couple throw a couple flashes in bracket. And they would throw this smoke. And this smoke is still being used in CS2, not as much just because the way the gaps are here. You can boost over it very easily, get a pick. Um, you can nade the smoke and try and catch a lurk. This smoke is somewhat nerfed by the way the new smoke mechanics work in CS2. But for the most part, the map is generally played the same. This smoke takes away the information from the opera who's CT. And remember how I was talking about how the opera like falls to like these kind of angles and just tries to pick the T's when they're, when they're taking map control. So if you throw this smoke, and you Molotov off lane. Now this Opera is isolated or whoever is in this position is isolated. And that puts this Arch player in a very, very weird situation. With this smoke coming down, he is forced essentially into this position. Now, if you flash this position, he has to make a decision. Do I get flash and fall back and hold the wrap? Or the threat is that they could smoke this off and then wrap A. So while you're in CT, your rotate's going to be too long to library. Let's say they smoke library as well. Now they're doing an A split. And just because they threw the smoke, they now isolated you. And now you have left only one or two players on the A bomb site, which percentage wise is very, very bad if a team is wrapping towards A. If a team is wrapping towards A, you want at least generally three people fighting that wrap or else you won't come out on top of the situation. It basically forces this arch player into a very weird position where it's do I fall back and hope that they push me CT? Or do I rotate around library and allow the T's to be able to wrap B, which again, if the T's wrap B with numbers, if they have like three people going towards CT, four people going towards CT, something like that, then this is a very tough situation to hold. This guy will probably get isolated. And then the B players are gonna be stuck having to either fight into banana or play into sight and fight the CT wrap, which again, can just get smoked or mollied in backhaul. And then boom, you lost the sight, you, lost, you don't have CT control. It's just a very, very weird round at that point. But this is just a way you can bully the CTs for having a long rotation. And especially the nature of arch is that you generally only have one here, because if you have two here, then there's going to be a gap either on A for like a halls pop or a lane pop, or there's going to be a gap on B because you're playing one B. Let's say you have two A site and then two towards arch. So you're playing one B. So this basically just abuses the fact that the rotations are very long. So whoever is in this position needs to be ready to rotate at all times to go to B. Generally, the arch player is going to be the first B rotate. So this guy needs to make so many decisions, and this is why you want generally your best players or your um, best thinkers, generally your smartest players on your team to be the arch player, because this guy has to make so many round deciding decisions on CT side that could win you or lose you the game. 
And then how lane or halls work is similar to the way that apps doesn't really factor into the map theory as much because going out apps kind of sucks on Mirage. Inferno is the same way. Coming out of halls, if they know that you're coming halls, they can just smoke you off. They can molly you. You know, you're running out into a balcony in the middle of sight. There's backside angle, midside angle, pit, mini pit. There's all these angles you have to deal with with halls. So the only reason you would be going halls is if you think one, the CT's numbers are slim or two, they're just not expecting it. And that's why teams will use Hall's Pops, is they will use them when they think the other team isn't expecting it. Generally, they won't use it as their main way of popping A, just because if CTs know it's coming, it sucks. And then the last thing for A would be a lane pop, which will just consist of an arch smoke, um, a couple over Hall's flashes, maybe a big pit molly. Your Hall's guy can throw these flashes for you, which pop back sight. They won't blind you coming up lane. They will blind anyone mini pit who's forced out from the molly. They'll blind anyone rotating moto. Anyone back sight on this area will also get blind by this flash. Anyone over here will get blinded by this flash. And that's why you'll see a lot of pro teams throw flashes like this. If you're coming up lane, sometimes the entry will throw this kind of flash and run up like this. But basically what you'll see on Inferno is you will rarely ever see executes uh, come out from the T's. It will almost always be sight pops unless they're doing an arch wrap. Um, just because of the choke points. And what I mean by choke points is pretty much every position on this map where you'd be coming into the bomb site from as a T side um, can get mollied or blocked by one smoke or one molly. And what I mean by that is you can molly halls, obviously, the all of halls. You can molly lane, which covers all of lane. You can molly um, banana. You can molly this. You can molly this. Right? There's all these sorts of mollies that will essentially completely block the entrance to the bomb site. But yeah, at a basic level, that's pretty much all you need to know as far as sites go or general um, site hitting theory, if I were to coin a term for it. If you were to play at like an advanced level or even like an advanced playoff level, that's the basic understanding that you really need to have for the sites. Now, to be able to hit a bomb site effectively, you need to know how to push rotates, pull rotates, etc., etc. And you will do that by taking bracket or taking car. Now, similar to the theory on Mirage, where it's you need to, as a CT, play for mid or you need to play for A, the CTs on Inferno have a very similar theory to be able to play the map to its highest percentage, which is you need to either play for car or you need to play for bracket. If you hold both, chances are your numbers are spread a little too thin to be able to have a, a good bomb site hold. And what I mean by that is if you have three people towards bracket and two people in car, you have a strong bracket hold, you have a strong car hold, but now apps is open. You have to have one guy either uh, lane holding apps like this or someone boosted and someone under holding like this, um, just general things like that. But you're essentially going to be leaving big gaps in your CT sides if you play very hard on bracket or you play very hard on car. So what CTs will do is they'll play for one or the other. And that's why you'll see pro teams start 3B or they'll start 4 towards A when they're doing like an early uh, A thing. And in a 3B scenario, basically what's going to be happening is the CTs will need to take banana control early on in the round. How the Ts can stop this is they can throw smoke in the middle of banana or something like this that will make it hard for the CTs to push. But if you have 3B, generally you want to be taking banana control every almost every single time because the amount of util that you'll be throwing to guarantee banana control will be able to tell the Ts that, hey, we have 3B right now, and then the T's, if it's a good caller, will probably call a speed up A, even if bracket is smoked. Now, if the B player is solo and you guys are playing 4 on A early, then the B player's job is to essentially make B look scarier than it actually is. He can do that by doing util, he can do that by spamming smokes, he can do that um, by doing all sorts of stuff. But basically, what he'll be doing is he'll be either mauling half wall like this, he'll be smoking on top of it after, and from T side, right, you're not going to be going through this molly. You're probably not going to be going through the smoke. And by the time the A players are done doing their A stuff, either getting set up in halls, getting set up in bracket, um, this player will have rotated now by the time the T's realize, oh shit, they only had one B the entire time. That's why you'll see a lot of slow rounds played on Inferno. For instance, VP play an extremely slow Inferno and generally their late round sight hits are always going to be good. The reason for this is because they spend the entire round figuring out where the CTs are playing what their rotates are looking like, how close their rotates are, and where the CTs are playing from. Pretty much all Jane calls on Virtus Pro is just extreme percentage gameplay. Basically, he's running down the clock and using it as, you know, a sixth teammate in a way. So he's going to be running down the clock to the point where the CTs are like, oh, there's no way they're going to hit this bomb site with this amount of time left. I'm going to rotate or vice versa, or I'm going to commit into site. And then just when you think you have the read right on CT side, 
last second Virtus Pro is going to be popping into the bomb site, running a wrap, running a lurk play, or something like that. And that is how you will play Inferno to its highest percentage, is you're going to be playing with rotates, figuring out where the CTs are playing, and hitting a bomb site, like I've been saying. Now, I'm not going to go into how to hit bomb sites. Um, for instance, like Inferno utility, or like B site utility, or A site utility, all this stuff. Um, you know, you can get the nades from Nard out here, or someone who does um, specific grenade content. Generally, what I'm talking about here is just theory, concepts um, of how to play maps. The individual micro uh, utility that you're going to be throwing is not something I really need to go over for you to understand the map. You just need to understand what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And just elaborating on the part I was talking about with Jame is you'll see them run slow T-sides, and the way that they'll run slow T-sides is they'll wait out the utility the CTs throw. So let's say the CTs start the round, let's say they're 3B, and the A guy wants to look big and scary, but scarier than he actually is because it's only one or two people at A. So he'll smoke bracket early, he'll molly into halls like this after he smokes bracket. He'll do things like that. And basically what VP does is they'll say, okay, that's fine. If you're going to make it look scarier than it actually is when you're only one or two there, you're going to throw a ton of util for that. So now we're going to wait out that util so that util is useless. And in a way, that is kind of the goal of the CTs. You want to make this T's wait so that you can get rotates through. But what VP does is because they, they play an extreme time game, you're going to be needing that utility late into the round. But yeah, I think that's it for a general uh, overview of Inferno and how to call it and um, general like how the map is played. Pretty much to sum it up, it's just all playing rotations as T side. Pretty much every single map has a caller, every default, every slow round, anything like that. You're going to be trying to get as much information as possible from your defaults. Um, I showed a couple ways of how to do that with the arch utility with um, some banana stuff. But for the most part, as a T side caller, you're just going to be trying to figure out where the CTs are playing from and then make your end round call. But yeah, if you like this video, go ahead and drop a like and a sub. Uh, it is much appreciated. My last video did pretty well, a lot better than my other videos. So um, I'm going to keep up this content. I might also start doing some individual content regarding positions. So for instance, Bianca on Mirage or Cat Player on Mirage or uh, you know B Player on Inferno, things like that, going more deeper into the micro of how to play in a team setting or play at a high level. But yeah, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys later. I stream almost every single day, Monday through Friday, 1 to 4 EST. If you want to catch me by there, ask me some questions, that would be great. But uh, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys later.